Thank you, Pastor Romel and Chantel, for the opportunity to share God's word with you this morning. Uh, yeah, it's quite a, an experience to share the word. Um, but yeah, we're so grateful and so thankful for God's faithfulness over the years and how God has kept us, and he's been gracious and merciful to us. And so I don't want to go too long into the sentiment part, but yeah, I just want to share a few thoughts this morning with you on something that God has really placed on my heart. And, you know, we've looked at this series with the life of Joseph for a period of time, and I think the last time I shared a few thoughts and Pastor Romel just asked all of us to contribute uh, that Sunday. But <clears throat> one of the things I'd like us to look at is the origins of Joseph. If you go to Genesis chapter 30, if you could please turn there, we'll read from verse 1 to 2. The origins of the life of Joseph, because it's so important, because remember, Genesis chapter 49, verse number 22, it says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. So his life is an expression of fruitfulness. Even his name, it means he will add. So everything about Joseph's life points to fruitfulness. So when we look at that life and we think about fruitfulness, we think about addition, it's very interesting because when we go to his origin, the origin of his life in Genesis chapter 30, verse number one, the Bible says, now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel and he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld you from the fruit of the womb? So it's very interesting because his mother had a situation and the situation was that she was barren, so she was unfruitful. Everyone say unfruitful. So <clears throat> the situation is that she's unfruitful, but there's a word that is locked up inside of her. There was a promise that was locked up. And we know that the, the, the word that was given in terms of jo jo um, Joseph being fruitful was a word that was going to be fulfilled by the Lord. But in Genesis chapter 30, verse number 3, she does something quite interesting. Verse number three, so she said, here is my maid, Billa, go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees, that I also may have children by her. So, family, this has become one of the problems that we face, is that in a time when barrenness, and firstly, barrenness, we must understand, barrenness comes from the Lord. The Bible says the Lord withheld from her the fruits of the womb. And this is not a new thing. This is not something that's strange, because Sarah was also barren, if you remember. And what did Sarah do? She got Hagar to go into Abraham, or Abraham to go into Hagar, rather. So we see that this is an issue, and one of the things that points to family is that we must understand that fruitfulness, first and foremost, comes from the Lord. It is the Lord who opens the womb. So very often in our lives, we're caught in a place where we are navigating, we're making a plan, we, you know, we're doing this, we're doing that, because we want the appearance of fruitfulness. So look at the delusion of Rachel. She says, here is my maid. She will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. But that was a delusion because the child would never be hers. And so the, the problem we find today with many Christians, a lot of the things that we do, it's put on, it's fake. So we're doing things, we, we, we're making a plan, we, 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 we're navigating, we're pushing hard because we want an appearance of fruitfulness, because there's a shamefulness to being barren. There's a shamefulness to being unfruitful. You're going to say, what are people going to think? Hey, people are going to think I'm a sinner. People are going to think, hey, what am I doing wrong? You know, people are going to think all of those things because I'm barren. And so you want their appearance. You want people to say, hey, that person is so fruitful. Look at that person. So verse number four to six says, then she gave him Billah, made his wife, and Jacob went in, and Billah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case. He has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. So she has these sons. She has these children. But now, family, I want you to understand that when we do these things of making our own plan, of making our own way, there's consequences to this. Genesis chapter 37, let's go to verse number two, Josh. Genesis chapter 37, verse number two, the Bible says, this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. The lad was with the sons of Bila and the sons of Zilpah. His father's wife. Now, this, look, this, that's very interesting, don't you think? Because it doesn't say the lad was with the sons of Leah. It says the sons of Bila and Zilpah. But who were Bila and Zilpah? They were, the ma they were the maidservants that were given to, to Jacob. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. 
So that which they thought they were making a plan, that which they thought they were bringing a solution to what God is doing, ended up being a trouble. It ended up being a thorn in the flesh. And later on, you'll see that this was actually the cause of Joseph being sold into Egypt. They were the ones that caused Joseph to, they are the ones that hated Joseph. And, you know, I shared this before because, remember, family, we can't do things artificially. We have to understand that God has to open the womb. And so today, even as I speak, we're going to speak about these things and, and, and consider a few thoughts today within the Scripture. So Genesis 30, verse number 22, the Bible says this, uh, Genesis 30, verse 22, Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. Now, here's the thing. When God eventually broke through for, 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 for uh, Rachel, because she had this mindset, the main agenda was not to give glory to God. When the breakthrough came, the agenda was God has taken away what? My reproach. Not that God has been faithful, God has been good. No, God took away my reproach. And so very often everything that we do is for our reputation. It's our image. We want to be seen in a certain way. So it was about her and wasn't about God. So imagine now, this is the, and this is the thing, is that she wanted more. Why did she want another son? It's because her sister has five children. So she's competing. She's in a place of competition. So as believers, we find ourselves, we're in this place of competition. So the church wants to do the other, outdo the other church. This pastor wants to outdo that pastor. This brother wants to outdo that brother. Because we're all in the space of competition. There's this wrestling. You know, that's what uh, 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 Rachel said. She said, that with great wrestlings, I've wrestled with my sister. And we find ourselves in this place where there's unnecessary competition. There's this unnecessary strife. But... I want to show you, family, when, when you know how to rest in God, when you know how to wait upon the Lord, verse number 25, the Bible says, Then it came to pass, when Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my own place and my own country. Amen. So the first thing that happens, when that which was from God was released, there was an activation of purpose. There was a restoration of covenants, because where was Jacob going when he said, Send me back? He was going back to the place where he met with God. Because remember, Genesis 28, he met with God. He made a promise to God. He said, if the Lord will be with me and bring me back to this place, uh, I will give a tent to him. And he remember, that place was called Bethel. So this was a restoration of the covenant of God. Why? Because he was able to know that which was from God was given and immediately purpose was activated. But not just purpose. The Bible says, send me away that I may go to my own place and my country, which means there was now dominion that was given to him. He was shifting away from being a servant in the house of Laban and he was going now to go and receive that which was his own. It was my country, my people. So it's very important, for family, that we understand that that which is given by God, as soon as that comes into our lives, it causes, causes us to walk into the purposes of God. Amen. So it's very important. So I've, I've shared about how, you know, the life of Joseph is also very significant because, remember, Jacob had two wives. He had, he had Leah and he had Rachel. But remember, what was the, what was the actual plan for Jacob? Who did Jacob love? Jacob loved Rachel. Rachel was the one that he loved, but he was tricked. So it's very important, family, that when we look at the life of, of Joseph, when you read Joseph's life, I want, to, I want, to, I want you to, to view the scriptures from another dynamic today. I don't want you to view Joseph as some good guy, as a nice guy. I want you to view Joseph as a God's firstborn son. You have to view him as the firstborn son. And the reason why you need to jo view Joseph as the firstborn is that, funny enough, Joseph was born last, but he was actually the firstborn. Why? Because Rachel was technically the first wife. So when Joseph was born, it wasn't just a, he wasn't just an ordinary individual that all these things took place in her life. The firstborn blessing was on the life of Joseph. The firstborn blessing was bestowed upon Joseph. So we see this throughout his life when he was first sold into Egypt, how for, the Bible says the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. It's strange because it's like, why this guy? How come? In fact, verse number two says this is the history of Jacob, Joseph. Why does it say that? Some people don't look like they, they believe me. If you go to 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse number 1, I want to show you that who believes me that Joseph was the firstborn? See, there's some doubts here. Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse number 1. 
Let's read it together. The Bible says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. Now, go go to verse 2, Josh. The Bible says, Yet Judah prevailed over his brother, and from him came a ruler, although the birthright was Joseph's. So Joseph was the firstborn. That's why all of those things happened in his life. He wasn't just a good guy. This was the birthright that was over the life of Joseph. So he was the firstborn. So now we need to have a look at this because remember, God could have given it not to Reuben. He could have given it to Simeon or Levi. He could have given it to Judah. The birthright could have gone to anyone else. Why Joseph? It's because that was that, was that which came from God. It's that which was given by God. And so you see the resistance. How come Leah was able to have children easily? And Rachel wasn't, because Rachel was the one who was clearly loved. Rachel was the one who was clearly given by God. But how come there was resistance when it came to her bearing fruit? So you see, very often, because that which is resisted, we can think that, no, it's been rejected by God. But the fact that there's a resistance, it's because it's been given by God. So we want things to be easy. We want, because we're going to church, because we're doing it, we want things to flow easily. But no, that's not the case. There is a resistance because it's that which has been given by God. It's that which comes from God. So we see that, that, so we're going to look at a few elements today of what does this blessing entail, of this blessing of the firstborn. So one of the first things is Numbers chapter 3, verse 13, the rights of the firstborn is that there's divine ownership. Everyone say divine ownership. ownership. Numbers 3, 13 says, because all the firstborn are mine, on the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast, they shall be mine, I am the Lord. You see, the problem was Jacob thought that Joseph belonged to him. That's why he protected him. That's why he kept him in the house. He kept him near to him because he thought that he was him. But he didn't realize the firstborn principle meant Joseph belonged to God. That's why Joseph, at the end of his life in Genesis, he could come to this conclusion and says, you sold me, but God sent me. Why? Because I belong to him. So everything about my life, everything that I went through wasn't actually about myself. It was about him because I belong to him. Genesis 45 verse 5, he says, Do not therefore be angry or grieved with yourselves. You sold me for God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse 8, so now it was not you who sent me, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house. So God had full rights to Joseph during the period of his life. Genesis 39 verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Genesis 39 verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So we see that the evidence of the firstborn blessing, first of all, is his presence, God's presence, because he owns you. Amen. So in our lives, family, the first, this is one of the things that, that have to manifest in our lives, is the first, the presence of God that is over our lives. The second thing that we see is the double portion. Now, Genesis 48, verse number 22, it says, Moreover, I have given to you one portion above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. This is Jacob speaking to his son. So we read earlier on in First Chronicles about how, how Joseph was actually given a portion above his brothers. He was given the double portion. And so it's important that, that, that we understand that the firstborn had access to this double portion. So the Bible says in Genesis 27, verse number 33, it says, Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who, where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me also, my father. But he said, Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times, and and he took away my birthright. And now look, he has taken away my blessing. Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed, I have made him your master, and all his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? That's a powerful blessing. That's a powerful, that's the, the double portion that God gives to us. And there's a double portion that comes because we, have, we function as the firstborn. And so it's important that we understand this. And it's quite a strange scripture because when you think about it, clearly God could have said, okay, 
we know what the truth was. Can't we just revoke this? But it couldn't be revoked. It was given. It was released to him. The blessings of God cannot be revoked. So it's important that we understand. And then we see this in the life of Joseph, Genesis 39. He says, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all to prosper that was in his hand. So it's important, family. Now, <clears throat> this is the challenge that we find with understanding the, 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 the position of the firstborn is that we always think about, when we think about the firstborn, we always think about ourselves. We think about um, our lives as, as the people. So you look at your position in life and you think, hey, how can I be the firstborn now? Because we all look at, and like, like Pastor Moshe, we all have problems, we all have difficulties, we all have challenges. And so very often when we look at ourselves according to those challenges, we, this thing seems like it's, it's, it's so far-fetched. How can I be God's firstborn? How can, because why? We look at our position. We look at where we're staying. We look at, at certain things. And so it's important that we, we develop this mindset to understand that this blessing is not about us. It's something that has been given to us by our Father. It's because the Father has chosen us. So Christ is the firstborn. So this is not in birth or creation, or, but in position. Firstborn is about a spiritual position, not a natural birth. So as Christ is our firstborn, we are one in him. That's why we have access to this position. John 17, verse 11, he says, Now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given, that they may be one as we are one. That they may all be one as you, Father, in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. So this firstborn position has been endowed unto us. So say amen. So we must be excited that this position has been given to us. This is something that has been imbued upon our lives. So the key to this and the key to understanding why God has done this for our lives, and this is where I'm, my message is going to, I'm going to go in depth into the, this. It's the Father's love. Everyone say the Father's love. Now, it's important that we understand this position of the Father's love because this is, a, this is an aspect that even myself, I'll be honest, I, I, I fully don't understand the Father's love. There's, there's things that have not really truly comprehended about the love that God has for us. But, and because you see, the problem is our understanding of love is all about goodness, it's all about, you know, blessings, it's all about, you know, things sort of going well for us, giving us gifts. That's what we understand about love. But God's love is very different. The first thing about his love is love suffers long and endures all things. And you find this in Deuteronomy 8, verse 22 to 5. It says, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Amen. So the Bible says that the Father loves us. He endured long with the people. He suffered long with the children of Israel. The Bible says that even in Jonah chapter 3, verse number 5, says, So the people of Nineveh, Nineveh believed God and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And so we see that God had this hope for this people. He had hope for his people. So although the people had still taken 40 years, think about this. He could have forsaken them after year two. He could have forsaken them after year three. But he stayed with them. He endured with them 40 years. And he still caused his promises to be fulfilled, although they kept delaying, kept delaying, kept delaying. But he still caused his promises to be fulfilled. And so it's important because we have to understand the fullness of the Father's love that is, in, that is over our lives. So... What is the exact extent of the Father's love? How much does the Father love us? John 17, verse number 22. Let's read from verse 22 to 23. It says, And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, this, this is the important part, and have loved them as you have loved me. So how much does the Father love you? He's loved you the same as he's loved Jesus. It's the same love. So if you want to look at it in a different way, Panache did accounting. 
So there's, there's different ways of, 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 of measuring the cost of an item. There's different ways. There's what Panache net realizable value, what net present value, there's historic cost. What's that? Market value. So if you want to look at all of these definitions, what was the, what was the cost? What, did, what was the price that was paid for your life? Christ was the price. So you, that is the value that God has placed on your life. So that is the extent of the love that, he, that God has for us. You see, what the problem is, this is the major problem that we find, is that our goals and our intentions are different from the goals and the intentions of God. See, our goals and our intention is that it would be well with us. God's goal and intention is sonship. He wants you to become a son. He wants you to live as his son. Our goal is we want things to be well with us. So Matthew 26, listen to this. Matthew 26, verse number 37, he says, And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and, and, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So Jesus was also depressed. He was also stressed. This is what the Bible says here. Am I reading correctly? It says he was sorrowful even to death. He was, he, this was a hectic situation. Jesus was stressed. But now this is where Jesus shows us the excellency of his sonship. He is the Rolls Royce of his sonship. He says, if it is possible, let this cup. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So this means that Jesus settled. He came to this point where he said, Father, this is not an ideal situation. I don't want to be in this. That's the reality. He said, I don't want to be. This is, it's stressful. Me. Take this cup away. But if not, let your will be done. So you see the way a son thinks versus the way an average Christian thinks. Because see what a Christian will do, a Christian will, you know, will, will get 50 scriptures to say, I must not feel pain, I must not suffer, I must not go through difficult times. Why? Because the Christian wants to run away. The Christian wants to escape this. But the Christian doesn't have a desire for the will of the Father. So 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse number 3 to 8, and let's look at another example of David. 1 Samuel chapter 30, the Bible says, so David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with them lifted up their voices and wept until they had no, power to, no more power to weep. Hectic, eh? And David's two wives, Anom the Jezreelites, and Abigail the, the widow of Nabal the Carmelites, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed. Hey, stress is a part of uh, this Christian walk, eh? <laughs> For the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, and every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the effort here to me. Now this, is, this, is, this shocked me when I, when I looked at this. And Abiathar brought the effort to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. Now, this is very powerful, because I don't know if you can see this family, but it's a very, very strange thing for a Christian to do. This person has been attacked. This person has lost everything. What is the natural response when you're going and you're finding this situation? You're going to go there. You're going to call SAPS. You're going to call your connections. You're going to find your connections. Say, who did this? Let's go look for them. You know, you're going to put, find my iPhone. You're going to go with cricket bats, and you're going to go and look for this guy, right? Come on, think about it. That's the natural response. I mean, someone kidnapped my wife and my kids. Uh, wh what am I praying for? I'm going. I'm go I, I, don't need, I don't need a second suggestion, you know? Maybe not the wife, but yeah, I don't need a second suggestion. You're going for it. <clears throat> No, think about it, family. You're going to go for this. Isn't that, I mean, isn't that the natural response? That's the natural response. We're going to go. We're going to fight. This is not even a question. We're going to go. We're going to fight. But David doesn't do that. He says, do I go, Lord? That means, Lord, if you are saying the stuff is gone, it's gone. If you are saying my wife is gone, it's just gone. If you are saying my kids are gone, they're gone. He said, Lord, let your will be done. That was his prayer. 
So very often people are looking at David's strength. We think, no, that means, hey, David got the courage. Now he went. No, he asked God. He said, Lord, what do I do? So you see how a son lives. A son lives for the will. A son doesn't live for his pleasure. Because his pleasure, he was a, David was a tough guy. This guy killed Goliath. This guy didn't need any, any second opinions on his CV. This was a man of war. David was rough. He was rough. He was a guy that could take on giants. He was a guy, he loved war. I mean, his father-in-law asked for how many, how many foreskins? 100 foreskins. How many did he take? He took 200, eh? I think, eh? A thousand, yeah. He took a thousand foreskins. Imagine that this guy was rough. He had a thirst for blood. Even God said, I can't, you've shed too much blood. God even said, you can't build us, you've shed too much. This guy was rough. He was tough. You know, he wasn't from the bluff, but he was rough and he was tough. No, this guy was, he was something else. But, but look at his heart. Look at how his heart was postured. His heart was so, so clearly postured to understand that I'm living here. Yes, it's not ideal. It's not perfect. But I'm here for his will. I'm here for the will of the Father. And just as an interesting note, I want to see here how I many, what was the end position of Jesus and David after these circumstances? What was the end position? What was there? What happened in the next chapters for both of their lives? They ended up on the throne. Come on. Why aren't we on the throne? Because every little problem we face, we're saying, Lord, save me. Every little problem we're facing, we're saying, Lord, deliver me. Every little problem we're facing, we're saying, Lord, bring me out, bring me out. We, we're trying to find Bila, we're trying to find Zilpa, we're trying to find Haggai, because everything, we're trying to make our own way out. We don't pray this prayer of saying, Father, let your will be done. Yes, it's tough, but I want to sit in the quietness and I want to understand, Lord, what is your will? Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Give me understanding. Help me to understand things from your realm, your perspective, because my sight is limited. And that's the reality. Our sight is limited. So we don't pray this prayer to say, Father, help me to see in the Spirit. Help me to see the way you want me to see. You see, the thing is, you need to understand, friend, about your life. Your life is, is lived from two realms. Your life is lived from two realms. You've got the one realm, which is your flesh. And the other realm, which is the realm of the spirit. So in the realm of the flesh, everything is about you. It's about your comfort. It's about your health. It's about your goodness. It's about your prosperity. But in the realm of the spirit, it's about the father. So in Romans chapter 8, it says, the spirit cries out, Abba. The spirit cries out, not the flesh. So a lot of the times, we are trying to serve God on the flesh, in the flesh, on the base. But you can't serve God in the flesh. You can't serve God from that realm. Yes, you can go to church. You can do the right things. You can, you know, say the right things. You can do all the stuff. But you can't ultimately serve God from that realm. You have to serve God from another realm. And that's the realm of His will. Because the end result of the realm of the Spirit is His will. The end, the end result of the realm of the flesh is your will. It's your desire. It's your joy, your happiness, your safety, your provision. So... It's important to understand that this is not a once-off thing. So very often when we speak about the will of God, we always bring it down to, okay, what is the will of God for my life? Oh, so, okay, my job now, God wants me to be in business, or I must have a job. Okay, God wants me to marry this girl, or this girl. God wants me to stay in Phoenix, or in Chatsworth. You know? So we have this thing of, it's always like once-off events. Like, but the will of God is not that. The will of God is a position. The will of God is a position. It's a position that you've taken that says, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Because remember, Jesus, in Matthew, in the, in, in Matthew chapter 3, something very strange happens. The Father says to Jesus, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Why was this strange? It's because his ministry hasn't even started. He hasn't even preached the first message. And the Father already says, I'm well pleased. Why? Because Jesus had the position. He had the position which was his will. That's why he knew that the son cannot fail. The son cannot fail because everything about the son is about my will. Everything about the son is going to do whatever I say to him. It doesn't matter how tough it is. And Jesus proved it. Jesus proved it. You see, if you're, if you're in the flesh, you'll be like Peter. He said, no, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Why? Because we're mindful of the things of men. We're mindful of the things of men. We, we, we absolutely love the things of men. We're consumed by it. And you know, I mean, you know, and it's, it's, such, a, it's such an interesting thing because this is the operating system of the world. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Zulu by birth. And, 
You know, one interesting thing about the, the Zulus is that, <clears throat> and, and, and I know Tandu will know this, when things are not going well for you, they say this in Zulu, thing, so they say that, no, you know, it's so things can go well for you. No, think about it. No, I want to, so, 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 the, so, so what you do in, in the Zulu culture is that when things are not going well, the first thing you do is you're going to go and buy a goat or buy a sheep, and you're going to sacrifice to your ancestors. Why, you, why do they do that? I'm teaching you something new today, so you understand why they do that. It's so that things will be well with them. Yeah. That's why they do them. So, so you see, their end result is the same as yours. So we are basically trying to do the same thing as them, but we are Christianizing it. We're Christianizing it. We're putting all the scriptures to this, but ultimately the end goal is the same. Like they want to prosper, you also wanting to prosper. Hey, we're chasing the blessing. All of us are chasing that blessing. We're chasing their well-being. I've got one guy in my staff, and I was chatting with him, and he was going through some stuff, and I said to him, hey, you know, you got so many problems, you need to go to church. He says, hey, I'm never going back to church. He says, the problems that started when I started going to church. <laughs> it's like, it's better when I ignored all the stuff when things, things started going well for me. Because why? In church, he said, the promise was everything was going to go well for him. He says, that's what I was told. I was told things were going to go well for me. He says, I lost so much money because I kept giving it to this person because he said, things are going to change in my life. And things never changed. And he left the church. So you see, family, we can't, we can't be deceivers. We need to tell people what the truth is. And the truth is, the end goal is for you to come into sonship. Whether God blesses you, we don't know. But the Bible says that he closes the womb. So he'll also open it. When? When he is ready. When God remembers, when God is ready, he will open it. But what are we doing? We are busy. No, we, we're making this plan. We're finding Bila. We're finding that we, we're hustling. We're hustling. We're hustling. We're trying. We're pushing. That's, we, we're doing it all by our own strength. And why? Because our end goal is we want to end up taking the glory for ourselves. We want people to see us. Hey, see how good that person is. Wow, look, him. So, he's so young. He's driving a Porsche. Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> Why? So I can go and I can tell you how good I am. Every time I go on the stage, why? I can tell you how good I am, how faithful I am. Say, no, hey, I served Pastor Ramon 20 years. <laughs> and be like, oh, wow, hey, he's so good. Hey, he's such a good example. Why? It's all, you see, all, we do these things just to bring glory to ourselves, but that's not the intention of the Father. Everything must come back to Him. Yeah. We, must, we must get tired of speaking about ourselves. It has to be about Him. I'm not saying we must, can't share testimonies and we can't... Do all of these things are good because they inspire, they motivate people. But ultimately, we have to tell the people the truth, and that is, God opened the womb. I can't say, now, I did this, this, and everything all of a sudden happened. Because when something doesn't happen in that person's life, they're going to say, but hey, you said, this is what you promised me. But God is dealing with them in a way. God is dealing with their sonship. God is doing something in their lives that they have to come to the conclusion of who Father is. Now, how do we come to this place of rest in our sonship? How do we come to this place of knowing God? Now, let's go to Jonah. <clears throat> this Jonah is quite an interesting character. He's a very colorful prophet. He's one of those guys that speaks his mind. He's not interested who's there. He's a very, very interesting character. Now, Jonah, in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, the Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the, pre Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. So we see that Jonah received the word of God, and intentionally, what did he do? He went the opposite way. Sorry. Jonah went the opposite way. He intentionally disobeyed God. So why, why I'm saying Jonah's life is interesting, family, is that we know from what the scripture says, and uh, if you remember the story of the man born blind, he said, he made a very powerful statement when he was speaking to the Pharisees. He said this, he says, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God, he hears him. Do you remember that? Because everyone, they were perplexed how Jesus could do a miracle on the Sabbath. And he says, we know God doesn't hear sinners. So you guys can say whatever you want about this guy. I don't know him. I never saw him, but God doesn't hear sinners. So these are the guiding principles that we have. 
So the reason why I'm reading this is because <clears throat> we understand the guiding principles that God gives us for his servants. Because think about it, God could have eliminated this guy. What did he do to uh, uh, um, the, the, the sons of Aaron? It swallowed them up. So why didn't he touch this guy? This sparked my interest. Why, why God entertain this, this, this clown? Verse number four to six, the Bible says, But the Lord sent out a great wind onto the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah, listen to this, but Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. <laughs> this guy is fast asleep. He's the cause of all these problems. He's in this boat. Things are happening and he's fast asleep. Now, this is interesting, family. This is interesting. So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean, sleep, arise, call on your God? Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said, uh, so he told them uh, uh, in, verse, uh, in verse 8 and 9, tells them, tells them that he ran away from God. He says, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Now look at the character of this guy. He could have come up with stories. They could have made a plan. They could have tried to, to give offering sacrifices. He gets straight to the point. He says, look, guys, this is because of me. He wakes up from his sleep. You don't know whether he's yawning and he's saying, hey, look, this is me. Just throw me in. But, but think about that. He was not fearful for his life. Think about this. He was not fearful for his life. And we're gonna really, we really need to investigate this. He was not fearful for his life. So he goes into, he's thrown, in, he's thrown into the sea. And then John 1 verse 17, it says, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now here's the second interesting thing. God didn't just leave him to drown. Why is God pursuing this guy so much? Why is God so interested in this guy? He could have left him to drown. But this, in fact, this became one of the testimonies that Jesus gave. He says, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish, so the son of man. Three days and three nights. On the third day, I'll be raised again. So God still kept pursuing this guy. He could have ended the story there, and he could have shown to us, hey, if you cross me, this is what will happen to you. Think about it. God could have shown as an example for his people. Say, if you ever double cross me, I'll finish you. <laughs> but God didn't. Again, he showed him mercy. Okay, so interesting. So let's see. Let's carry on in this. Where, where is this thing going? It says, Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah, Jonah onto dry land. Hey, man, this is still, this guy is deliverance after deliverance, help after help. How often have you been praying for deliverance? You're serving God faithfully. God is not answering you. This guy is running away from God. God hears his one prayer just like that. Think about it. We're laughing. I'm, I'm a, I was upset. That's why I read this. I was angry. I'm saying, but Lord, you are telling us if we follow you, how come this guy, he's going the wrong way? You give him a business class ticket. Now he's going into his purpose. He's restored just like that. One shot, he was restored to his purpose. And you know, there's the, 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 there was a, a study done. There was a gentleman. I haven't confirmed this, verified this myself. But... When apparently the people of Nineveh used to worship the fish. Yeah. So when Jonah was spat out, the reason why he was so powerful, the message was so powerful is because they saw this man being yeah. given by their God. Yeah. So Jonah 3 verse 1 to 5, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Verse 5, So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed the fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. Come on. How long have you, Pastor Ramal, how long have you been preaching? People are not listening. <laughs> Here's this guy, unfaithful, he's going the wrong way. One message, a city gets saved. 
Come on, think about it. That's powerful. One message. We people are, are, are impressed with Peter 3,000. This guy was an entire city. And Nineveh was a great, the Bible says three days in, in extent. Can you imagine how big the city was? And all those people gave their hearts. Why? This one faulty character gave a message and they all believed. So why, 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 why did this happen through Jonah? Why Jonah? God could have done this through faithful people like Jeremiah. He could have done this through faithful people like Isaiah. I mean, there's so many good prophets, but this faulty guy, hey, everything just seemed to happen for this guy, man. Everything just seemed to happen for this guy. Now let's look at this. John chapter 4, verse number 1. got five minutes left. John chapter 4, Bible says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Look how immature this guy is. He prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was this not? So now we're going to get an understanding of why, why God is pursuing Jonah. This is very important, family. We're going to understand the thinking of Jonah. He says, So he prayed and said, Ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. Why? For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents from doing harm. Therefore, take my life, for it's better for me to die. Why, did he, why was he able to run away from God? Why was he able to sleep through the storm? Why was, because he knew that God was good. He knew the goodness of God. He knew that God was too kind. That's why he didn't want to go and preach the message. But he says, Lord, you're wasting my time. You are too good. I know what you're going to do already. Why are you sending? And, they, and what, how do we know? Because that's what he's saying to God. He says, is this not what I said? Because, Lord, you could have just gone and saved him. Why did you have to send me? Because I know you, that you're a good God. So what's going to cause you to sleep in your storm? How can you fall asleep in your storm? How can you offer your life willingly? Because you know who God is. You know his love. That's why when, we say, when I'm saying to you that as a son, you don't have to pray for deliverance, it's because you trust in who your father is. So when you say his will, the father loves you. So the father is not going to allow you to be destroyed. But do you trust that? That is the question. Do you believe that? Do you trust in your whole heart that, Father, I'm in this situation that is painful, that is difficult. I don't know what to do. But I'm going to trust you. Why? Because he loves you. The father loves you. The father loves the son. And what is the love that he has? It's the same love that he had for Jesus. That's the highest value of love that he has. He loves you. And what is his intention? John 17 verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you. He wants you to know him. He wants you to know him as father. He wants you to know him as your father. You don't have to fear, family. You don't have to fear. So when you're in your garden of Gethsemane, when you're in your ziklag, when you're in whatever difficult, you can trust him. Don't try to make your own way out. Don't try to produce a false sense of fruitfulness. Trust him. Rely on him. He's your father. He loves you. He cares for you. Pray for his will. Pray for his will. See, this is the key, family. You have to believe deep in your heart that the father has his best interest for you. He has his best interest for you. He has the best things in mind for you. So you don't have to fear. You don't have to fear. We're not far away from the throne. I can tell you that, family, we're not far from the throne. The throne is one chapter away. But the throne is determined by one prayer, and that prayer is, your will be done. It's not, Lord, save me. That's not the prayer. In fact, we need to stop those prayers now. The prayer now needs to be, Father, show me your will. Give me wisdom, give me understanding, give me might, give me counsel. Help me to see, help me to understand, help me adjust and quickly run to your will. And be posture positioned in my life to go into your will. Because the Father loves the Son. And I want to give you that encouragement, fam. The Father loves you. The Father loves us. He's been so gracious to us. I mean, you heard Panasha's testimony last week of how the Father was able to, to bring a young man from, from being an orphan to bring him to this place where he is today. The Father loves us, and we have to trust that family. And the problem that we have today is we don't believe that. We can say all the things, but we don't believe. That's why we make our own way. So we can say we can worship, we can, we can say everything, but every, even, even our own plans, we try to justify them using the Scriptures. We try to justify all the things that we are doing, all because we're making our own way. But I want to encourage you today, family, to trust in the rest in the Father. 
And when you rest in the Father, you'll be able to sleep through the storm because you know, you know with all your heart. I mean, think about this. Who else slept through the storm? So who, think about this. So Jonah and, them, and Jesus had the same mentality. That's how powerful. The, although he was a faulty character, he was immature. He was, look at him. Even in, at the end, he was still childish. Same, but why? The one thing they had right, he knew his God. He knew his God. So we're trying to, we are trying to prove our faithfulness, but we don't know God. <laughs> Come on. We are trying to prove our faithfulness, our goodness, but we don't know him. What is the key? Because we need to know him. We must know him, family. And I want to encourage you that we get really engaged in a deep pursuit of the Father, really engaged in a deep pursuit of the will of the Father. It's difficult. And the thing is, like Jesus, David, this is a, it's a life of great stress. Unfortunately, I don't have any, any good answers for that. It's a life of great stress. But the stress is to bring us to a position. And in the, in the stress, we have to find rest. We have to find rest in the stress. Because other, 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 otherwise, if we don't truly come to that place, even as good people, we will perish. Because that's the alternative of eternal life is perishing. And so I want to encourage you and leave you with those words today and really pray that you've been blessed um, and challenged by the word of God today. Amen. Amen.